welcome to all of you to this afternoon seminar about the Caribbean and Pacific experiences of free association and where we will also discuss free association in Greenland. What's the possible prospects of this way of organizing a possible future sovereignty? My name is Marie Base and I'm a journalist and communications officer here at DIES and I will help us steer through this uh, afternoon's discussions with our two experts that I have with me here on stage. Um, but before we start, I would actually like to ask a question to you in the audience, where you can just raise your hands. Um, so how many of you think that Greenland will form its own independent state within the coming decade? That's before 2023, <laughs> You can also uh, chip in if you want, <laughs> not much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I feel a little bit of hesitation also in the audience, um, which is probably not that, uh, I actually understand that very well since as we've also been talking about earlier here at DIES, this way of asking the question is probably a little bit too simple or simplified. Um, and that's why we, we wanted to have today's seminar to nuance the debate, a little, the debate a little bit and talk about free association and what this implies. Um, before our, I introduce our two, two speakers, I will just give a little bit of background about this concept of free association, which I had never actually heard of before I started collaborating with the, with the two researchers here. Um, free association was sort of invented <laughs> following the, the Second World War, where the United Nations was formed and identified free associations, free association, as one of various ways to to decolonize and to pol uh, achieve political uh, decolonization. Most countries in this period were, were decolonized um, by by ascending to full independence right away, and a few like Greenland by being incorporated into the metropolitan center. Um, but free association was sort of a third way where a colony or dependent territory could could uh, acquire um, uh, acquire sovereignty, but voluntarily voluntarily uh, sort of relinqu relinquish some of that uh, sovereignty by entering into a free uh, a treaty of association, typically with the former colonizer. So th this was just a brief outline, and we've tried to uh, to make sort of a very short uh, description here of the three ways of decolonizing, um, where independent independent right away and being incorporated is maybe a little more I don't know can seem a little more simple than free association. What I've come to know of it, at least. Um, Just learned how to use this one, and um, no, yes. So um, free when when Greenland was uh, was decolonized in 1953, free association was not sort of on the table or mentioned as an option. And in 2007, we have a picture here of the the report Deesh published a sort of fairly critical report on the process of the decolonization of uh, Greenland. However, the report has been criticized both then when it was published and recently for not being sufficiently critical towards this process of decolonization of Greenland. And the process of the decolonization itself has also been subject to more and more criticism. Today, however, we will not uh, will not discuss this so much, but we'll try to look ahead and uh, and talk about free association because this is something that Greenland has actually been exploring uh, 
um, as a new way forward for the last 30 years. Um, and in the draft constitution that we also have here, um, which was presented in April, free association was referred in, in the com commentaries uh, accompanying this constitutional draft. Um, so today we'll talk, as I said, about free association. What is it? What are the experiences, the experiences from other former colonies and colonizers? And what can Greenland, especially Greenland, but also Denmark learn from this? So that was a bit of a long introduction, but now to our two uh, experts today I have here with me on stage, Rafael Cox Alomar, and you're a professor of law at the University of the District of Columbia, and an expert on constitutional law under decolonization. And uh, our own DIS researcher, Ulrik Pram Gad, who's an expert on Greenlandic Danish relationship. And uh, Rafael has recently written and published this policy brief in English about uh, Greenland and Puerto Rico and how they are alike and also different. And Ulrik has published this policy brief. And uh, you'll find the Danish policy brief and also a Greenlandic version out in the lobby. And this, unfortunately, we only have, this is the last English copy. So we have some Greenlandic copies. And if you're not able to read Greenlandic, we have made this very very um, advanced, high-tech uh, <laughs> sli uh, 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 yeah, slide with, with QR codes that you can scan nice. and find the different policy brief. Nice. Yeah, that we, uh, <laughs> that we made about free association in other places than Greenland. Yes, but if you scan, your phone will take you there <laughs> to the right place. Um, yeah, and I also have to remember to mention that this uh, today's oh. seminar is actually a follow-up seminar on a seminar that we held in Nuuk in May, um, where we have made this very beautiful slide with a lot of text, but it's just to show you all the important people that were there, um, <laughs> who, yeah, most of them are in Greenland, so we're not able to attend today. Um, and um, and uh, yeah, we had a lineup of Greenlandic and international speakers, and also people from the the yeah political part of Greenland. Um, so I think that's all the long introduction to today's subject. So now we have <laughs> something to something completely different. Many of you might remember that in 2019, Donald Trump offered to buy Greenland from Denmark. Um, and some of you might know, but most people probably not, that he actually also offered to swap Greenland for Puerto Rico, so that Denmark could get Puerto Rico and uh, the US could get Greenland in, in, in return. So, Rafael, how could he do that? Well, uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to thank Dees for this wonderful invitation. I have been living in Copenhagen for the past month and a half. This is my second visit to this wonderful city. And we have been exploring and writing and thinking and uh, commenting on Greenland's challenges and what the future perhaps might hold for Greenland. Before I answer your question, I want to address the following issue that some of you might be entertaining right now. Why is this guy from Puerto Rico, this Puerto Rican lawyer who teaches law in Washington, D.C., talking about Greenland? I mean, why was the connection between Greenland and Puerto Rico? And as Marie is intimating, what happens is that Puerto Rico is also uh, looking at self-determination possibilities. And in 2021, at the end of 2022, there was a bill 
passed in the U.S. House of Representatives, the Self-Determination Act for Puerto Rico, um, that basically provided for the holding of a federal plebiscite in Puerto Rico for the people of Puerto Rico finally to choose whether to fully integrate to the United States as a state or go forward as, a, as an independent country or come up with a free association arrangement. So that's the relationship between what happens in Puerto Rico and that's how we got to know each other because as these things were unfolding in the Puerto Rico context, in the meantime, interesting conversations have been happening in Greenland. So there you have it. Now, Donald Trump, could he actually acquire Greenland, perhaps in the 19th century? But nowadays, in the 21st century, this is not a real estate deal because you have, you have a human beings. You have a historical, sociologically defined community living in Greenland. So the idea that a superpower can actually come and purchase Greenland as if it were a real estate or a condo in, in the middle of New York, I mean, that, that really runs afoul some ba very basic principles of public international law as we know public international law in the 21st century. Now, let me just open a very, very short parenthesis. The United States, and if you go back into the archives, the United States has been interested in acquiring Greenland since the mid 19th century. There was an offer of, there was an offer made in 1867 under the administration of President Andrew Johnson to actually purchase Greenland right after America purchased Alaska from the Russian Tsar, it also entertained the possibility of buying Greenland. There was even a report produced and commissioned at the behest of the US State Department, which is available in the internet, in 1867 about purchasing Greenland. The Danish crown rejected the offer. In 1910, there was another attempt at actually swapping parts of the Philippines for Greenland. That did not fly. In 1920, again, uh, at the end of the Wilson administration, just at the end of the First World War, there was another attempt by the United States of acquiring Greenland. The United States had already acquired the Danish Virgin Islands, as you know, for $25 million, 1916. And again, in 1946, President Truman tried to purchase Greenland that was also rejected by the Danish authorities. So there's a history, right? So Donald Trump, he came up with this idea that for some people seem bizarre, but as we will discuss here, the geopolitics in the Arctic are far changing. Climate change is making the Arctic much more accessible to Russia, China, and many other geopolitical players. America obviously has an interest, has always had an interest in Greenland. And it seems to me that, and we can have this conversation later on, if Greenland, you might disagree, Marie might disagree, but I think if Greenland were to seek independence and achieve independence, next day America is gonna come knocking on the door. <coughs> <clears throat> to see whether the Greenlanders might be amenable to negotiating perhaps a free association arrangement with them. So, you know, I think the Arctic now has become the new frontier in terms of geopolitics, and this whole conversation is pretty exciting. So, so Greenland, Puerto Rico, like Greenland, is also exploring the possibility of free association, but their relationship with the U.S., is somewhat different as they are neither independent nor a part of the United States. So well, what is Green Puerto Rico? Well, in my estimation, and in that sense, some scholars like Professor Harhoff would, would actually agree that what Greenland has at the moment, pursuant to the 2009 Self-Government Act, is a modality of free association. I think that what Greenland has at the moment is a modality of free association. Now, what is free association, right? That's mm. the big question. What is 
free association. Where is free association defined? So the United Nations, in a series of resolutions passed in 1960, at the height of the crisis of decolonization, passed a series of resolutions, specifically Resolution 1541 of 1960, basically establishing that there are three ways to achieve decolonization. Full independence, full integration, and free association. Free association is not really defined by the United Nations. The only three requirements for free association are that the associated state issues its own local constitution without interference from the metropolitan power, that the associated state be able to secede unilaterally, and that the choices made by the associated state be made in the exercise of its right to right to self-determination without any sort of interference from the metropolitan center. That's it. Those are the only specific requirements. Now, the idea of free association is that you are a sovereign entity, but you are going to delegate some of your authority to a metropolitan power to act on your behalf. Not because the metropolitan power has imposed itself, but because you have voluntarily asked the metropolitan power to act on your behalf in terms of defense, in terms of foreign affairs, in terms of uh, some aspects of trade, perhaps monetary policy, etc. So free association is, in a way, the third way. It's not full integration, nor is it full separation. And intellectually, if you want to look at the intellectual origins of free association, you should actually take a look at the British colonial mm. modalities of administration. So the British had crown colonies, but they also had dominions like Canada, Australia, New Zealand, which were parts of the realm, but they had ample internal and external authority. They had international legal personality, but at the same time, they were part of the realm of the British empire. And that's something very similar to what Greenland has at the moment, right? Greenland is part of the Danish realm since 1953. Um, and pursuant to the 2009 self-government statute, Greenland has a tremendous internal and external authority, more so than, one, than what Puerto Rico has at the moment, much more than, than what Puerto Rico has at the moment under the American flag. And like, did you want to add something? Uh, can, because I, I, I understood at some point that when Puerto Rico was decolonized, accepted by the UN in, in the 50s, it was understood that Puerto Rico would have then have free association. But as you explained to me earlier, it suddenly dawned a couple of years ago that that wasn't really the case. You couldn't sustain the argument that Puerto Rico's relation to the US was free. Well, let's let's just pause for a second and, and try and understand. When we say that in 1953, I don't know if people are fully uh, uh, if people know what happened, you know, in 1953, right? Uh, the Danish government, right, went to the United Nations, as so the United States in that same year, 1953, also went to the United Nations, basically saying that they would no longer be sending information on Greenland, the Danes, and on Puerto Rico, the Americans, right, because both jurisdictions had a, they were no longer dependent territories, right? 
as defined by the United Nations Charter. And the argument was made that somehow these two jurisdictions had achieved full self-government, that they were no longer dependent territories. But in reality, in the context of Puerto Rico and in the context of Greenland, the peoples of those places really did not have the full panoply of choices before them. When Puerto Rico's case went to the United Nations in 1953, the people of Puerto Rico had only voted in a referendum yes or no with respect to the new arrangement. At no point did the people of Puerto Rico were provided with all the choices in a plebiscite or referendum. The same thing happened in Greenland. In Greenland, there was a Greenland committee and there was a constitutional commission in Denmark. Uh, and there were a series of legal opinions issued by the foremost legal scholars of Denmark. And the choice was made by representatives of the people of Greenland, not by the people of Greenland themselves, as to whether they wanted to integrate into the realm have the constitution of the realm now applied to Greenland and have full representation in the Danish parliament. But those choices were made by few people. Those choices were not made on the basis of the full package. And those choices were never put to the people of Greenland. No? So, so the question is, are these, are these jurisdictions really decolonized? Mm -hmm. Have they really been fully decolonized? I put to you that the answer is no. There's still work to do in terms of achieving full decolonization in both jurisdictions. And in this work, we might be inspired by some other true former colonies that moved on towards more independence or what some call full independence through this free association. So. Could you tell us a little bit more about, you? maybe it's mostly you, Rafael, but maybe also you, Ulrich, about the experiences of free association in the Pacific? Who has free association? It's well, these countries, right? Yeah, in the Pacific, it's interesting because the Marshall Islands, Micronesia and Palau, these were entities placed in the under the supervision of the United Nations after the Second World War. So the Marshall Islands, Micronesia, and Palau, really, these were German colonies in the late 19th century. Then they were transferred to the Japanese Empire at the beginning of the 20th century. And after the end of the Second World War, with the defeat of the Japanese Empire, they were placed in a trust at the United Nations. The United Nations then appointed the United States as the trustee for these jurisdictions in 1945. And eventually, the United States negotiated a series of free association arrangements with these three jurisdictions. And as recent as last year, the United States renegotiated its free association arrangements with these three jurisdictions in light of its intense geopolitical confrontation with China. So, and then obviously the Cook Islands and, and knew they have a free association arrangement with New Zealand, but really this free association arrangement with New Zealand, if you look at it from an intellectual, from a historical perspective, mirrors the arrangement New Zealand had with Great Britain since the beginning of the 20th century up till the end of the Second World War. So those are generous arrangements in terms of internal self-governments. I mean, they have much more authority than what Puerto Rico has and they have authority that's somehow similar to what Greenland has in terms of you know, being able to negotiate treaties with foreign sovereigns, in terms of having a consultation mechanism to deal with um, the applicability of metropolitan law, 
locally. So, so these are interesting um, models, much more advanced than what Puerto Rico has and somehow similar to what Greenland at the moment has. And what, how do they differ? Maybe we, we made this illustration for one of our policy briefs actually about the United Nations. So something you might guess that these three are members of the United Nations, sure. the U.S. Uh, Free Associated States, and these are not. So that's a difference. What what? There's what another the difference, other which is yeah. and and this is an interesting difference, which is that uh, in the context of these three jurisdictions, they do have this free association arrangement with the United States. But those populations, the people who are born in these three jurisdictions, they are not U.S. citizens at birth. Unlike the people of Puerto Rico who are born as U.S. citizens. Now, in the Cook context. People, bo people born in the Cook Islands, they have New Zealander citizenship. Um, and they have full access to New Zealand. In terms of these three jurisdictions, people born here, they are nationals of Palau, nationals of Micronesia, nationals of the Marshall Islands. They do not have US citizen, which means that uh, they have special arrangements for traveling into the U.S. and for working in the United States, which adds a layer of complexity to the relationship. In the context of Greenland, obviously, as you know, people born in Greenland, they're Danish citizens. They have full access to Denmark, and that's a fundamental distinction between the free association arrangements America has in the Pacific and what Greenland has at the moment with Denmark. And are there other uh, other important differences? Maybe um, I know that these three that are members of the UN associated with the United Nations, they also have uh, delegated some sovereignty over their security issues, right? To the United Nations. To the United States. Uh, to the United States, sure. sorry. Especially, you know, and mostly now, I mean, if you look at the geopolitics, you know, I'm a firm believer that geopolitics is the driver of most of these relationships. So if you look at the geopolitics, I mean, this, uh, these folks, these islands, these archipelagos are right next to the Philippines. And you know what happened in the Philippines a couple of days ago, right? With a uh, Filipino ship that was basically overrun by Chinese, the Chinese Navy, no? And the Philippines is just the nearest tip to Taiwan. So if something were to happen in Taiwan, obviously, you know, the Philippines and this area is going to play a key role in terms of defending America's interests. So that's the reason why America only last fall renegotiated its arrangements with its Pacific Free Associated States. Um, you know, so, so those are some interesting differences. There's another difference. The highest court of appeal of these three places is in Palau, Micronesia, and the Marshall Islands. So if you, get, if you take a case, there's a, a litigation that doesn't go to the Washington Supreme Court. Now, in the context of the Cook Islands, the highest court of appeals in the Cook Islands, um, interestingly enough, is in London, the Privy Council in London. In the context of Puerto Rico, the highest court of appeal is in Washington, D.C., the U.S. Supreme Court. So there is no size fits all. Mm. Each of these jurisdictions has its own peculiarities. And those peculiarities and nuances are driven to a large degree on the geopolitics, on the interests of the metropolitan centers. And Ulaik, did you have anything to add about yeah, that? I'm not a lawyer. I'm a political scientist, so I... I That's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of read the, the overall structure of, of these relationships. In the American cases, Palau, Micronesia, and Marshall Islands, it very much, much reads like kind of a transaction, right? I give you something, you get something in return. Basically, that the, the U.S. gets a security veto and base rights. And uh, the, the Micronesians, Marshallese, and, and Palauians, they get uh, a lump sum or a sum of, of subsidies, uh, and then they get certain rights uh, 
for, uh, in terms of mobility uh, to, to the US. And it also, it has an end. Uh, it's, it's basically a contract of, of the first one was 20 years, 30 years, and now there's a new one. So it ends, so, but if, if, if uh, you don't renegotiate, the thing will in principle end. Whereas if you read the, the New Zealand Cook Island relation, it's, it, it, it looks more like a, a family business, business that, uh, that we have a, a shared culture, shared values, uh, and, and it's just right that we, you are masters in your own home, but we still uh, provide you with a certain uh, subsidy. And, and maybe I cut off my mic, but now I try. Is it better? I'm sorry. Uh, but also that it, it doesn't have an end. It doesn't have a. a, a, a it, it, it never terminates this agreement. Uh, it, it, it's, it's basically a, a permanent condition, you might say, a permanent relation, uh, un, unless someone uh, changes it. So, the the the, the way the the relationships uh, looks uh, are different in that way. Mm. Uh, it's interesting you say that because if we go back to the Puerto Rico case. You're going to see that at the height of the Cold War, the Caribbean was a, a very strategic place. Right after the Cuban Revolution of 1959, the Bay of Pigs crisis, the missile crisis of October 1962, the um, invasion of the Dominican Republic by Lyndon Johnson in 1965, what happened in Grenada when Ronald Reagan invaded Grenada and subsequently George H.W. Bush invading Panama, 1989. I'll just quickly stop you and move to the right slide because we actually <laughs> we made some extra slides which we will not be using right now. But this one, this one okay. about the Caribbean because so it, yeah. yeah, free association has actually also existed in this area. That's right. So. Yeah. Again, geopolitics plays a huge role. I mean, the Caribbean, I think the Arctic has become the new Caribbean, perhaps. But cooler. Perhaps, <laughs> you know, but so you far. Know, yeah. You know, we have Cuba here, Puerto Rico here. So the 1960s, the reason why the United States was so concerned with and so uh, adamant at actually devolving more authority to Puerto Rico was that you know the Caribbean was a hotbed of revolution against American interest. That's how it was perceived in Washington, right? So in the context of the Caribbean, other examples of free association are the Dutch islands, Curaçao, Aruba, St. Martin, right? Uh, in 2010, they renegotiated the relationship with, with the Hague. And now they have a relationship to the Hague that's very similar to the Greenlandic relationship to Copenhagen, right? Now these islands are components of the Dutch kingdom, much as Greenland and the Faroe are components of the Danish kingdom. Uh, but they can also enter into arrangements and treaties with foreign sovereigns, just as Greenland is able to enter into agreements with foreign sovereigns. Now, in the case of the Dutch islands, different from Greenland, they also have control over their monetary policy. So in the context of Greenland, it's a Danish kroner. But in the context of Aruba, Curaçao, San Martin, they have their own Giller, the Antillian Giller, which is not the Euro, right? Obviously, the Dutch have the Euro, but uh, their partners in the Caribbean, they have their own central bank, their own monetary policy. They enter into agreements with foreign sovereigns. They send plenipotentiary ministers to The Hague uh, to discuss issues pertaining to the Caribbean with the Dutch authorities. So in that sense, it's also similar to the Greenlandic relationship in which there are consultation mechanisms and there is a presence of Greenlandic ministers. And uh, in the context of Aruba, Curaçao, and San Martin, legislation passed in The Hague is not immediately applicable to them. Right? And there's a consultation mechanism as well. 
right? So the Dutch government cannot legislate unilaterally for these Caribbean jurisdictions, right? These Caribbean jurisdictions have something to say. That's completely impossible and completely uh, non-existent in the Puerto Rico context. In the Puerto Rico context, the US Congress decides all legislation passed by the US Congress is applicable to Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico has no authority to negotiate any treaties with anybody, right? Everything has to go through the US State Department. Puerto Rico, therefore, has no international legal personality, which is very different from the Greenlandic case, which is very different from the Dutch Caribbean case. But these, these islands, they used to have a free association agreement, but terminated it to become less dependent or... Well, these are the, those are the British islands, right? So I spoke about the Dutch islands. I spoke about Puerto Rico, but then these islands here, for the most part, these are formerly British colonies, right? So the Caribbean, you had British colonies, Dutch colonies, there's some French uh, there were French colonies, Spanish colonies, right? But the British islands, excluding Jamaica, which went to independence in 1962, and Trinidad and Tobago that went to independence in 1962 as well, these islands in the late 60s negotiated a free association arrangement with London. But in the British context, free association was the stepping stone to independence. Because by the early 80s, late 70s, most of these islands had achieved its independence, right? Their independence. So, so in that sense, the British model at least is a model that somehow was negotiated in a way to have free association as a stepping stone. Whereas in the Dutch context, free association has remained. Now, in the Greenlandic context, it remains to be seen. <laughs> when uh, Marie asked for a show of hands, I only saw two persons saying that perhaps in the next 10 years, Greenland might actually move to independence. So it remains to be seen whether in the Greenlandic context, free association will be a stepping stone to independence or whether it's going to be the last stop in Greenland's decolonizing quest. And who like, You've been following Greenlandic politics for decades. Um, so what do Greenlandic politicians want from this free association? Yeah, I think um, now uh, this is this is uh, pretty complex and confusing in a sense. And, and Raphael says that if you do a solid legal analysis, sound legal analysis of Greenlandic's, Greenland's current status, you would say that this is free association already. Uh, as the Greenlandic political debate apprehends this question, uh, free association is still something in the future, something we can achieve. Uh, now we have a status where we began as a colony, then we were integrated, then we got powers devolved from Copenhagen, more powers devolved from Copenhagen than the home rule and self-government. But basically, Greenlandic politicians, the Greenlandic uh, political scene basically sees itself as under Danish sovereignty. So it, it sees that it needs to take a step to go to free association. Raphael seems to disagree and as Raphael mentioned, Frederick Harhoff, who is one of the constitutional experts on this, actually also recently says that, that well, self-government, that is a form of free association. Nevertheless, uh, Greenlandic politicians have been debating free association as their next step since even before uh, self-government. Uh, and it's the way um, I've been following, but mainly this, this brief we I have here, it's, it's, it's written together with a colleague from University of Greenland, Rasmus Leander Nielsen, but really who, who, who did the hard work was uh, Mikkel Østergaard as a master's student. Uh, he, he did an, a really thorough analysis of all Greenlandic politi political debates ever on free association. And then he went on to become a secretary for the for the in, in the parliament of greenland so he's been following this really this debate really close he says that uh, and, and and we with him say that the basic thing 
that Greenlanders see as a perspective in free association is to be an e to be equal to other nations, basically. Now we are still kind of a colony. We want to be really equal as a nation state to others. Uh, and, and having free association would mean that we could take home sovereignty and then afterwards we can freely associate us with other countries. So the basic thing that everybody agrees on is that it, it should be a step towards equality as sovereign. That would mean that we could be members of the UN, we could uh, play in the Olympics under our own flag instead of uh, of, um, of the Danish flag, and, and that that's the kind of examples that are always mentioned as positives in these deba debates. Then the other message uh, that came out of, of, of Mikkel's very thorough analysis is that when we get into all the specifics, all the differences between these variety of free association uh, arrangements, then it's actually not clear what it, it what what difference it should make. Uh, and and we when Greenlandic politicians have been speaking, why, what can we do with free association? It's actually not a coherent story. Uh, and, and I think we, we try to distill these three uh, choices or dilemmas or, uh, that, that are those. You really need to decide from the Greenlandic side before you can approach another version of, or a, a formal, formal uh, version of, of free association. You need to decide whether the whole point is to secure Danish citizenship as uh, the Cook Islands has New Zealand's uh, citizenship, or lately it's been debated as a way of getting rid of Danish citizenship because it's something that was imposed uh, on Greenlanders in 1953 as part of, of, of uh, the integration. So, so there's a basic choice there. Should another version or a new free association, should that uh, mean that, that Greenlanders should still be Danish citizens or not, citizens or not, and if not, how can we then secure the rights of Greenlanders to education, health, mobility, whatever migration uh, in Denmark? So, so that that's two things that needs to be condensed on the Greenlandic side. Next thing is: is it a means to get rid of the subsidies from Denmark, or is it a means to secure that we will like uh, the Marshall Islands, for instance? Also, in the future, past independence, past sovereignty, have a, a, a lump sum su su subsidy, uh, or is it a way to to get rid of these subsidies and and just secure that we can buy the services we need, like uh, if there is some kind of special competence in in, in bureau in in the, in the administration we need, we don't have it in Nuuk, then we kind of Denmark has agreed to sell that s that service to us, but that that means that's means that uh, we want the service but but should be able to pay for it. And then of course the, the final question is uh, ab ab about uh, security and defense particularly. It's clear, as I mentioned, everybody wa the point of free association is to be able to do your own foreign policy all the time. But it's also clear that, that security and, and defense policies will be a very important bargaining chip when, when if you want something from other countries you you would need that. But the way politicians in Greenland have been debating on uh, promoting free associations, sometimes it's uh, a question of, okay, then we will finally be able to define our own security and defense policy. At other times, it's the contrary that, okay, that would be a way for us to secure ourselves in cooperation with some someone else, or even this is what we can bargain with. That's why we are attractive for someone else to, to associate with. So in a sense, uh when when we read Greenlandic debates about free association association it's very much been kind of a, a an empty signifier something that could tell you this will be better if we are uh, freely associated instead of having self government and particularly on this idea that we will then be equal to other nations there is a difference but it's not really cl clear what kind of uh, of substance such a, a free association uh, agreement should have uh, can i i would like to react to what ulrich is saying um, because i think there's a danger in these debates of getting actually lost a little bit in semantics um, and let's just put all these the technical legal aspects aside because I think what's going on here is that 
Greenland, it seems as if there is a um, sense amongst some voices, some quarters in Greenland that Greenland should eventually accede to full independence. But the question is, what, is the, what are the economics for financing full independence? So let's just put the technical things aside now. Let's just talk a bit of common sense. I mean, because I think what's going on here, and I feel it in my heart because that's the same dilemma we have back in, in Puerto Rico, but, but you know, we are, we are very nationalist in Puerto Rico. We are very proud people in Puerto Rico. We, we would do anything to defend the honor of our country. And we see ourselves as sociologically different, distinct. We see ourselves as a peoples. And the same thing, I think, happens with, with uh, Greenland's uh, population, right? There's this feeling of pride. But then there are the logistics of economics. I mean, you know, obviously, when you're thinking about, about free association, means that you know you cannot withstand on your own the burdens of, of independence. No? And therefore, you're negotiating an agreement with another uh, sovereign to actually be able to protect your interests, defend yourself, and survive. So. I guess what what really is happening in the Greenlandic society is that uh, you know there seems to be a push for independence, but the question then is how to achieve that independence. I think my opinion is that what Greenland has at the moment is fundamentally a modality of free association, and what uh, you know uh, some some voices are trying to achieve really is not free association. They're trying to achieve independence, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. Now, why do I say that Greenland already has, under this 2009 statute, free association? Because under this document, which was actually ratified by the people of Greenland in the polls and was actually ratified by the Danish Folketing, um, Greenland has been recognized here its right to independence, Greenland has been irrevocably granted and delegated sizable powers in terms of foreign relations. Um, Greenland has, pursuant to this document, authority that cannot be taken away by the Danish parliament, right? So, in a sense, it seems to me as if Greenland, under its current status, has what most free associated jurisdictions actually have, right? I guess the, the pink elephant in the room, right, the unarticulated premise in this conversation has to do with the, to quote Eric Williams from Trinidad and Tobago, has to do with the economics of nationhood. That's a different convert. That's a that's a whole different conversation. That's opening a, a kind of worms. I mean, what's the economics of nationhood for Greenland? What's the economics of nationhood for Puerto Rico? In the case of Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico is super dependent on the United States financially. Right, over a fourth of Puerto Rico's budget comes from uh, monies that come from the U.S. Treasury. Monies from the U.S. Treasury flow to Puerto Rico, uh, both at the institutional level and at the personal level. I mean, people receiving all sorts of assistance from the United States. I mean, it's very difficult to break the cycle of economic dependency and build a nation state from scratch. If you are bound financially to the metropolitan center, so in the case of Greenland, the big challenge is how are you going to finance your independence, right? That's the big question. In my estimation, for what I have seen in Greenland, if the Greenlander people were fully financially self-sufficient, they will go for independence immediately, arguably. And then perhaps they could negotiate 
a series of mutual defense treaties with Denmark or the United States, who knows? What's the economics of nationhood? That, that's, the, that's the big question, right? Obviously, Greenland, is a, in terms of population, is a small. Puerto Rico has 3.2 million people. And it's like 200 times smaller than Greenland. Greenland has 55,000 people or so, right? So, so again, you know, it, it's, it's how do you go about financing? Greenland receives half of its budget comes from the block grant, right? That's 3.4 billion Danish kroners, right? How do you replace that? I mean, how do you negotiate? Would Copenhagen be interested in negotiating some, some sort of facing down of the block grant while giving independence to Greenland, but still having to somehow partially send funds to Greenland? Is that possible? I mean, is that politically possible in Copenhagen? I mean, is there the political will in the Folketing to negotiate something like that with Greenland? You know, giving them independence while also keep sending in a phasing out proposition the block grant. Is that something that's amenable to, to Copenhagen as a way of preventing the Chinese and the Russians or the Americans of actually grabbing Greenland? I mean, those are tough questions. And those are not legal questions. Those are policy questions, political questions, right? And it's actually also, I think one of the questions in, in this recent policy brief is the goal to secure the current level of Danish service subsidies or phase them out, and how would one do that? But we have now a draft constitution from April, so does that clarify any of these questions or the questions that, uh, the concerns or the dilemmas that Rafael also raised? I'd, I'd very much like to answer that, but can you scroll back to the Pacific slide, uh, the one with the showing all the five? Yes. A bit more, because I think... Of course. There, this, this one. one. There, there, there's yeah. Basically, I think when, when, uh, when Greenland politicians think of this in terms of strategy, there are two, two ways ahead. One is kind of do do the, uh, the appeal to Denmark, like uh, in, in the Cook case, that okay we we have this historical relationship. Uh, Denmark is very fond of telling stories about itself, how it's a benevolent colonizer. It's not we, we didn't really have colonies. We didn't kill anyone. We it's, we, we're really good at, at this, and, and we're still nice. See, we're so nice. We sent a lot of of, uh, of subsidies to to Greenland without really getting anything. In uh, in return, uh, and and we really like to tell that story, and and, and that would be one of the strategies that Greenlanders could uh, could appeal to Denmark to the natural continuation of this story about our relation is that okay, you uh, you let us go now, you, we, we don't you don't keep us within this constitution, you let us go have our own constitution, we'll have a free association agreement, and you'll keep paying. Uh, block grant subsidies that would be the one way ahead that that what you we we, <laughs> we get independence and the subsidies because we have this special relation the yeah, other version like the that uh, would be the cook islands the cook islands and, and the relationship with new zealand the other version yeah. would be that ah this is in the minds of greenlands we're really really attractive we have this piece of real estate here that's very nicely located uh, particularly for the U.S., right, because the U.S. needs Greenland to defend itself against whatever comes in from Russia and, and China and wherever. So we are really valuable. So in, in a sense, we can exchange our geostrategic location for a large sum of money for the next decades. And that's basically what the U.S. does in, in Palau, Micronesia, and, and Marshall Islands, right? They send subsidies and get a right uh, to have a, a security veto and, and, and base rights. So. The thing is, uh, of course, then Greenland would have to swap these security, s th this security aspect of sovereignty at, at, at in, in some level to get the subsidies back, whether it would be Denmark or the US who, who should then kind of take this deal. And there, if now I'm ready to, to, <laughs> <laughs> to talk about the, the constitution. Yeah, because does that say yeah. anything about what, what strategy Greenland might use to get what they would... Mm. Pursue as as free association, even though Rafael argues that 
what what Greenland already has. At least it puts some deli- some limits on what future Greenland governments could do. This, you know, the constitutional committee in Greenland reported they have a draft now. It doesn't have any official status in the sense, but it's meant to be lying around, debated, and then someday put into into effect as the constitution of an in- independent Greenlandic state. If it comes out in this version, uh, there are provisions in it, and not law text, but some of the debates, some of the commentary that explains the law text, which would say, okay, there are limits to what you can, how how much of your security sovereignty you can swap away as a or trade away as a as the government of an independent Greenland. Uh, the, the text in, in the constitution itself says something like, you know, the Danish constitution has this uh, article 1920, 20, I think, that says we can leave sovereignty to international organizations like the EU. There's a similar text here in the Greenlandic draft constitution saying we can leave sovereignty to international organizations or to another state, so you can do that. But uh, it also discusses what cannot be, uh, what kind of under what conditions sovereignty can be left to other states. And here it says stuff like, you, uh, you all, if, if you delegate something, you help have to retain possibility of exerting influence. So you cannot give it totally away. You need to have, you need to have insight in it. it uh, the way uh, these other states administer this sovereignty over Greenland should never uh, inflict the territorial integrity of Greenland. It shouldn't undermine democracy and people should be able to have, uh, citizens should be able to lead s- safe and meaningful lives. You shouldn't violate Greenlandic citizens and it should always be revocable. So some of these limitations to the free association deals that a future sovereign Greenlandic government would allow itself to do, they don't square very well with at least how I read the compacts of free association the U.S. has with uh, have with these uh, Pacific islands. So this constitution might not be the final version. The uh, the value of this property, Greenland for Arctic property for for, d- for defense reasons, might be so high that that the U.S. or Denmark would take it even under these constitu- uh, these conditions. But at the point of departure, the draft constitution has made it put some limitations on what kind of free association uh, agreements Greenland could could enter into that might make it it more difficult uh, for Greenland to to get a partner on board. And where do you think, where does this leave us, Rafael and Ulrich? I'm going to raise raise a tough question (laughs) that that doesn't have an an immediate answer, but I'm going to leave this question there for you guys. Uh, those of you who are thinking and, and reading and writing about this subject, I'm going to put it to you. Uh, does it require an amendment of the Danish constitution for Greenland to become a so-called free associated state? I mean, do you require a, a constitutional amendment of the Danish, I mean, the Danish constitution basically says that that this is a realm and uh, that realm is made up of obviously Denmark, Greenland and the Faroe Islands, right? That's the, that's the constitutional text since it was amended in 1953. Now the question is if Greenland were to become a, you know, Newly fangled free associated state, etc. Uh, would it still be part of the realm? Would now the realm be Denmark and the Faroe Islands? I mean, I mean, th- th- those are technical questions, but those are important technical questions for the authorities in Copenhagen. Um, and again, I think that in light of the fact that the Arctic now has become the new geopolitical frontier, if you look at the map of the Arctic, you're going to see that half of the Arctic line is basically owned by Russia. China has amazing economic interest in the Arctic. Climate change is going to make possible the Northeast Passage. Obviously, the Chinese, that's going to be the new Silk Route for the Chinese across the Northeastern Passage. 
The geopolitics of the Arctic are going to require looking hard at, at how to accommodate Greenland's self-determination uh, desires with the realities, the geopolitical realities, and perhaps a favorable negotiation for the Greenlanders is going to come their way in light of, geopo of the geopolitics of the region. In other words, the geopolitics of the region might force Denmark's hand to negotiate an arrangement that might be much more uh, profitable, even economically, for, for Greenland. Huh? Um, another question for you is, how would Denmark look geopolitically without Greenland? So what would be Denmark's relevance in the Arctic debate if it did not have Greenland anymore? What do you think? <laughs>